Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm Jenny Rivett, the Business Development and Partnership Manager at London Sport. I hope you're having a fantastic time at the Active London Conference yesterday and this morning. Um, if, like me, you've been massively inspired by all of our amazing speakers, um, you're in for a real treat with our next guest. Um, she's enjoyed a stellar career um, on the track and is now making a massive impact off the track too. Um, so it's a privilege to be joined by our Active London host, Jeanette Crutchy, um, sports broadcaster and five-time <laughs> <laughs> um, British track champion. Um, so yes, are you doing all right? Yeah, I'm good. Enjoying today? I am enjoying today. I'm, I'm really enjoying today. I think that what London Sport have done here, honestly, the setup, I, I love it. It's given me inspiration to go home, <laughs> rejig my living room. I'm really into it. So whoever did that, shout out to you. But no, I'm having a great time. Thank you for good, having me. Good. Thank you for having us. Um, and we're just going to have a, a chat, I guess, about um, your experience working for the BBC and Channel 4, um, particularly this summer's Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. Um, and I guess reflecting on how we are as an industry, um, aiming to better engage with audiences um, and getting Londoners most active. And obviously you grew up in London, Indeed. so um, yeah. it's great you've got that living experience as well. So we've got about 15 minutes um, for some questions that I'll give to you. And then um, we've got five minutes for some questions for delegates afterwards. So if any of you have got a question, please pop it in the Q&A chat box. Um, they'll feed through to us um, a bit later on. But yeah, please put your thoughts and questions in there. So without further ado, um, <laughs> um, as we've been chatting before this, it seems you've had a pretty busy summer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no rest at all. Um, so it'd be great if you could tell us a little bit about your experience of being out in Tokyo. Um, and I imagine it's a bit more unique than normal for oh, obvious reasons. It yeah. was the strangest Olympic Games for anyone, whether you're an athlete who's never been before, an athlete who has been before, or a broadcaster, or even a you know, television company having to navigate what was COVID. But um, yeah, I did the Tokyo Olympics. I was there for three weeks in total, did that for the BBC. My main job um, in Tokyo was trackside reporter. So I'm that really annoying person. When the athletes finished and they're out of breath and they're panting and they can't even think straight, I put a microphone in their face and ask them, I am that person, I'm like, tell us how you feel. And it's quite clear that you know, they're very much in their emotions. So um, that was my main job for the athletics. But of course, being a, a sports reporter, you know, it was nice to actually kind of show my range and be out there and do the boxing and the triathlon. So it was, it was a really great experience. I did that. So I did that for the whole of the games, did the opening ceremonies and the closing ceremonies. Then I came home for 12 days oh. and then I went back out for two <laughs> weeks. So I went back out for the Paralympic Games, I did yeah. that for Channel 4. Um, and to be in a position, you know, Jenny, where you are in and at and around an Olympic Games and no spectators are there, I felt really privileged. The conditions were tough, let's not you know, make any mistake about that but I felt super privileged to be out there knowing that I'm covering an event that in hundreds of years, people will talk about this thing that had no spectators and wow, what a time people went through during that period. Yeah, amazing. And I bet, particularly in the athletics stadium with what's normally yeah. thousands of people, yeah. um, do you think that the athletes miss that audience participation or benefited from yeah, it in different ways? I think it depends on who you are, really. I think a number of the athletes had known for some time there were not going to be um, spectators or, you know, even if there were, there'll be minimal. Mm. So you had to gear yourself up for that. Mm. And I think it showed in their performances. We saw some incredible performances. I think three world records in the stadium, um, two of which are over the 400 meter hurdles, men and women. And it was just phenomenal to be there to watch some of those things happen because you thought, wow, they don't even need a crowd. And they're doing it in the morning. They're doing these performances in the heat. So, you know, it was just, it's amazing to see what the human body can do. But it does make you think, wow, maybe we might have seen more world record performances had there been a crowd. Because not everybody performed how they would want to, but yeah. you, know, you can't put that down just to not, there not being any crowds there. Yeah, for sure. And I guess, obviously, your, your experience at Beijing in 2008, um, and then to being trackside is completely different. Yeah. Your, your <laughs> definition of trackside is very different. Um, and I guess it would be so interesting to learn about your journey from being that athlete and dedicating all of your time 
effort and energy to to that discipline to then transitioning into becoming a journalist yeah. in a, which I think was around 2013 mm -hmm. in um, yeah and a broadcaster and I guess how that transition happened would be super interesting to hear about. Yeah I am um, so for those who don't know I just before the London 2012 Olympics had a really nasty injury um, I was going into the Olympic Games in London as the, the fastest woman in the UK, you know, I was pretty much a shoe in for the team. And then I picked up an Achilles injury. Achilles injuries are horrendous. You literally, you can't do anything. So um, I wasn't able to go to London 2012. It was devastating. I'm an East London girl, so to see everything be built on my patch <laughs> and still just not be able to go was just so heartbreaking. But mm. I saw it as an opportunity to maybe start to think about what's next. And that came with talking to a few broadcasters during around the London 2012 Olympics and doing a few kind of, you know, small radio gigs, a few television appearances. And then um, when the London Olympics came and went, I thought, wow, I just didn't have the drive anymore to, to do the athletics. You know, it's mm. tough, it's six days a week. Yeah. Any coaches or any organizations that are watching know that <laughs> when you get to a certain level, the training gets really tough. So I decided to move into something that still piqued my interest yeah. whilst I still had the energy and the drive and the motivation, and mm. that was um, journalism. So I was always quite good at English at school. I thought, let me put my mind to actually <laughs> writing things down yeah. and speak and could always talk clearly. Um, so I decided to combine the two and move into that space. And yeah, it was a, it's been an interesting journey because I applied the same work ethic that I have as an athlete. I started, you know, very much by going back to, to school, getting my multimedia dipl diploma in journalism. So I'm a trained journalist, you know, I wanted to train as a broadcaster, I needed to understand all the different levels to this rather than just get popped into place and yeah. kind of sink. I didn't want to be that person. Mm. So I'm still on the journey, you know, and, I, and I'm enjoying it. Um, I have to be away from home quite a lot. Priorities change now. I've got two very small children, so yeah. it is about navigating that whole, that whole aspect of life. But listen, I absolutely, I love my job. I wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah, you're doing an amazing job Thank here you. as well. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think um, with changing, uh, I think it's amazing that you obviously went out and got that qualification to be treated seriously. Yeah. In that, you know, lots of athletes when they retire don't yeah. know what they're doing or don't um, exactly know which direction to, yeah. to move in. So that's always really hard for a lot great. of athletes. And I think that there are organisations out there that do help a lot of elite athletes try and transition, but a lot of it has to come from their own networks and surroundings yeah. and understanding actually of life away from elite sport, which can be very scary, I'll tell yeah. you that. You know, you're, in, <laughs> you're in this schedule six days a week, pretty much you know, 10 to 15 years of your life. And all of a sudden someone says, okay, that's it now, and yeah. you're kind of pushed out on your own with a lot of growing and learning to do. Yeah, sure. Gosh. <laughs> well, sorry to scare you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I think it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing story, and, and the fact that you've said you're still on that journey and yeah. learning all the time mm -hmm. is great. And I think a lot of yeah athletes thinking about retiring can can learn a lot, oh, learn a lot you. from you. So that's great. Um, just moving on, I guess, to a bit about. Um, linking back, back to Active London. Um, quite a lot of our speakers have talked about social inequalities um, generally, but yeah. also um, across our London boroughs, um, and particularly the role that sport can play in, um, uh, I guess, challenging that. Um, just keen to understand what your view is on the current state yeah. of play there. And um, yeah, it's very topical. Yeah, no, no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a massive advocate for community level working on the ground and understanding what's happening in the different pockets of London. Um, I'm so, like, I'm so connected to London. It's one of those cities, cities it's just, you, you leave it, you get annoyed with it all the time. You know, transport, <laughs> traffic, weather, you're having a good old moan, parking ticket. As soon as someone takes you out for two weeks, you're dying to come home. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like that there, there is that draw with London, you know, across the world, and we have to appreciate that. And it's down to our diversity. It's yeah. down to the fact that we are in a place and space where we learn so much from one another. And sport in London, the power of sport is just unbelievable. We've got 13 professional, you know, big football clubs that, that operate in and around London. Mm. So many stadiums, so many parks, so many pitches. It's about understanding how we get people from the pitch to really understand the impact that they could have in other places as well. So 
I see a different kind of animal, a different kind of beast when it comes down to Londoners and how we're able to focus and have that gaze and that lens mm -hmm. dependent on the people that live here. And that goes right down from me being at school. We had the accessibility of the track right near my home. I'd just jump on a bus. It was a 15 minute bus ride. Mm -hmm. And I'd be there two nights a week. We had volunteer coaches, they'd be there and they'd understand it. And that happens in so many different sports. And it still happens now, you know, I work quite closely with UK coaching. Yeah. And what they're able to do and show me in terms of the volunteer structure and setup across the country is really special. That's no different in London. Mm. And it's like, how do we make sure that we have all of these different strands that come together and essentially unify the capital and understanding utilise the power of sport. We've got some amazing sports people globally who've done so well from London. I'm so proud yeah. of them. You know, we can, we can name so many of them. Yeah. Like, they're like global exports. And you look at them and think, wow, yeah, they're so London. And that for me is, that, that's, that's a special thing. And that's been for years, it's now, and it's not gonna stop. So it's about us to make sure that we always uh, are kind of oiling the machine and making sure all the cogs are turning at the right pace to keep that going, that production line going. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and all of the partners and delegates that are on our Active London are all champion that and yeah. challenging, you know, those levels of inequality that do exist across yes. across London and coming up with loads of different solutions to tackle that, whether that be tech solutions or more traditional sports development programmes, um, like your track, yeah. you know, having access to track and just being able to go down there is, is, is great. And listen, you forget about these things. Look, we have, an Olympic Park in East London. And sometimes I feel it's not always as accessible as it should be, or it could be based on the place in London where it is, you know, it's yeah. one of the poorest boroughs in the country. Mm. That, you know, there are, there are, you know, schemes and, and projects in place to make sure people do have access, but let's, let's make those widely available, let yeah. people understand where, they're, where they are. Yeah. And um, it was interesting listening to Temi and Latif on the cycling and, and walking chat. Um, he spoke about the Black Unity bike ride and, you know, he spoke about the fact that within 10 days a ride was organised and, wow, you know, 1,500 people predominantly from the black community turned up mm -hmm. and you're thinking, oh, but you never really see black people riding out and about. Mm -hmm. But when they all come together, you think, oh, okay, there's clearly a community, there's a need and a position and a place to make sure that everybody can be inclusive. Yeah, definitely. And I think over the, particularly yesterday, we had one session that focused on communities yeah. and how important that is and um, um, some of the takeaways were you know actually communities are doing a load of stuff themselves and doing it right yes but we need to um, add to that mm -hmm. but just also that's consultation and listen to what they want um, and not just put programs on for the sake of it mm -hmm. um, yeah t tailor tailor what we're doing so yeah. that people feel that they have that opportunity to yeah. to access opportunities as and when they want to. Yeah, just make so. it, I, think, I think you just make it a listening exercise, right? You yeah, know, sit down, so. have the communities there in front of you and understand what they need. Like, you know, I think the biggest and best story that comes out of London for me in terms of um, inequality or offering up opportunity is the jockey Khadija Mella. Khadija Mella, an amazing jockey. She won a race at Goodwood two years ago. She's a young Asian hijabi girl who rode out of a riding school in the middle of Brixton. Yeah. You never hear these kind of things <laughs> anywhere else. And yeah. what a great job and how yeah. inspiring. Mm. So I think for me, those are the kind of stories we need to hear more of and have more visibility on. And then I think we'll fly even higher. I think so. And people like you who have lived your whole life in yeah. London will have those stories. And I guess people like me who've worked in London for a long time, mm -hmm. too long, so I shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't say too, how, how long. Um, but yeah, to, to bring those stories out. Not many mm -hmm. people will know, you know, there's, there's you know, talent out there. horse riding in Brixton or, you know, the BMX track in Burgess Park yeah, in, exactly. in, in Southwark, you know, those, those absolute gems that mm -hmm people need and, and need to access. Absolutely. Sure. And I guess that track by your house was... Um, it's right there and they've they renovated it. It looks great. You know, I, my, uh, <laughs> I took my son there when he was uh, around about two and a half. Didn't quite understand what was happening. He just thought one was making me run <laughs> off this track. <laughs> but it was still nice to think, oh wow, all these years I've been able to bring my son back here. So, yeah. you know, being able to have those leisure facilities that are still in good condition and being looked after are yeah. absolutely key. Yeah. And I think, yeah, part of London sports work is to make sure that they still remain yes, there, absolutely. evolve and develop to yeah. the needs of those communities sure. as well. Um, great. Okay, I think um, we can move on to some delegate questions yeah. now. So I'm just going to have a look what we've got. Um, uh, let's have a look. 
Um, okay, so this is kind of linking back to one of our first questions, but um, what support did you receive from England Athletics and Team GB after you retired? I suppose linking to your transition into yeah. a journalist, which mm -hmm. seems like you took that on yourself yeah, to do a lot of it. A but lot of that. Did you get extra support? You don't really. And it, you know, it's something that no. needs to be addressed. I think there is, um, there's definitely room and space for a duty of care when it comes down to governing bodies and organisations. Mm when you are an athlete looking looking after you when when you retire when you stop and i didn't really get that and mm. i think that for you'll see you know a lot of athletes and sports people they struggle after because they don't have that direction or the guidance so they do rely on their personal teams to be able to do that whilst you're an athlete you do have a lifestyle advisor um, but what's interesting you're not always thinking about that yeah. when you're an athlete yeah. so you almost need it after but um like, like i said i think that there is room for a lot of organizations to work on that and and see some of the best practices they can offer and i'm always you know happy to help and i think will reach out to me anyway yeah. just to kind of get an idea of you know what they think or, or what i think they should potentially move towards or how they go about doing that and do, do you think you have a role to play or have had in your other with your other hats on <laughs> to to young people around the potential roles within sports yeah. so, you know, lots of athletes will see you or see t Tom Daly or whoever mm -hmm. from Tokyo um, and think, I really want to be an athlete. Yeah. But do you feel you've got a role to say, you could also be a physio, you could also be a journalist? Yeah. You could Absolutely. Yeah. And, it's, and, it's, and that's the thing, you know, a, a very, very small um, percentage of athletes become elite athletes yeah. and are able yeah. to do well. And even the ones that become elite, you know, making a living from that is also quite hard. It is yeah. the, the, the margins are so, so small. Yeah. I worked with the Youth Sport Trust for 10 years and working with them, I did loads of stuff around programming and school visits to help young kids understand and take some of the lessons from sport and how they can apply them to any area in sport. And mm. I think that was really important. It's just, like we say, having the access, the accessibility to know that these things can happen. You know, you can be an agent. A physio, a nutritionist, a sports scientist, you know, there are so many things you could do and still be in and around sport because it's such a passion point. People yeah. always want to have, you know, such a connection to it. Yeah, for sure. Great. And I guess just lastly, as we're running out of time, it's gone oh, so sorry. quick. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, it's just, yeah, I guess, is there anything you, any advice you've got for the delegates and the partners that are listening in, yeah. but also, are, you know, everyone who's been part of Active London the last couple of days to... I guess keep going, championing what we're doing yeah. to make London the most active city in the whole world. It's, yeah. big, big <laughs> ask. it's a big ask. It's a big ask. It is a big ask, but I think, what, like, like I said, what, what we have in London is very special. Do you know what I mean? We have a very diverse community, a very aware yeah. community, and it's about not really looking at people who are not really active and saying, I'll oh, do this and you know, beating them over the head with a stick or whatever it may be, mm. but just helping people understand the benefits and where that could take you, you know, how, how we feel when we know we're active and when we're helping people get active, it's, it's, that, it's that feeling and just staying as connected to the passion as possible. Yeah. It's so easy, isn't it, to get caught up in the red tape and the bureaucracy mm. and the politics, but actually, fundamentally, let's remember why we love what we do and why we love sport, you know. Yeah. And I always say to people, just remember back to your first ever sports day, that anticipation, that feeling of thinking, oh my goodness, why is my teacher making me do this? But when you did it, hopefully when you finished, you felt all right about it. And that's kind of, <laughs> that's yeah. kind of how we feel about work, yeah. right? You know, it's yeah. having these big projects, taking them on, but once it's done, you just feel so good. Yeah, absolutely. And ev everyone um, will find their own sports. Exactly. Even if they find it at that first sports day. Absolutely. Or they find it when they are later in life. I'm sure they will. Brilliant. Jeanette, thank you so, thank so you. much. That's so quick. I know, it's no, so quick. So we'll carry on chatting afterwards, <laughs> I'm sure, when we're off camera. Um, but just, just um, as we wrap up now, um, for all those delegates out there, for lunchtime, um, just a real quick reminder that we've got the TRX session because it's National Fitness Day today. Um, we're going to pop in the chat the link so you can um, join that at half 12. I've been told it's a 20-minute um, circuit style activity so pop your sports stuff on um, and get ready for that um, i think a few of us at the team here will be joining in <laughs> um, and also then join us back here at one o'clock for a really interesting and topical session on social prescribing um, enjoy your lunch and jeanette thanks so much Thank for you, being our host Thank generally you. and for chatting with me in our yeah. in our lovely living, in our room. living room and i'll be back at <laughs> yeah. one to, to yeah. take you through everything so yeah. thanks jen brilliant thanks so much thanks. Thank you.